Jesus, thank you that when we're walking the wrong way, you come like the two on the road to Emmaus and you come and walk with us just long enough to get our attention when we turn around. Thank you for that, Lord. Been pondering all week on that, just how you come to us. Even when we are going the wrong way and we justify it and slap a Bible verse on it, Lord, you still, in all your mercy and patience, you come walk with us. You're so incredibly patient with your people, Father. And we're grateful for that tonight. Love really is patient. You really are, Lord. And we welcome your hand to move in this place tonight, God, to lead us, to redirect us, to humble us where we're unwilling to humble ourselves. We're expectant, Father, as we open your word that we'll hear you because you promise us, Lord, if we'll seek you with all of our heart, we'll find you. So we seek first your kingdom. We place value upon you and who you are and your will above who we are and what we want. So may we hear not what we want tonight, but what we need to hear. Have your way in this place, Father. We welcome your voice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus the living tabernacle of God, had been walking in the wilderness just like the one in the book of Exodus. And after 40 days of the living tabernacle of God, walking full of the Spirit, it says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth when he had been brought up, where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he stood, he had opened the book, and he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, yeah, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus, the living tabernacle, was anointed, given authority from above to bring recovery of sight to the blind. I don't know if you've ever known someone or met someone who is blind and what that's like, specifically someone who used to see because it's recovery of sight that used to have light and now it's nothing but darkness and what that's like for them. Jesus was anointed to bring recovery of sight. He could always see us. We just, well, we couldn't see him. And when Jesus came on the scene in John chapter 9, there was a blind man that he saw in verse 1 of chapter 9. Jesus passed by and he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Teacher, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither. This man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work that the works of him who sent me while it is day, and the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he sped on the ground and made clay with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. 
So he went and washed and came back seeing. Seeing why? Because the light of the world showed up. And all along, Jesus is looking at this man who can't see him. Jesus says, I can see you, but you can't see me. Jesus wants us to see him. That, that brought me to tears today in worship, going, Lord, that's, the whole, that's why you came as the light, because you wanted me to see you. You saw me, but you knew I couldn't see you, but you were sent and you were anointed to give me vision to see who you are. Because we're all blind. See, there were those that saw this man that was blind physically, visually, and could see, but they didn't realize they were blind too. Hey, we're all blind until Jesus shows up, right? Until the anointed one comes to open our eyes, we're all blind, especially the ones that don't think they're blind. (laughs) You know, Jesus said in John chapter 8, He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That was what Jesus came. He came to be this beacon of light to open the eyes of the blind. See, people who got their visual sight back, that was only an illustration, you see. I mean, those eyes one day would stop seeing visually again. That wasn't the point, that we'd actually see Jesus. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I love this verse, chapter 4, he says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God is showing who he is. He is the exact representation of God, Jesus. He's the light of the world, you see. See, I've been praying about this whole tabernacle and the furnishings and going, so Lord, what is the point of the lampstand? David, the point is I can see you, but you can't see me, and I want you to see me. That's why I opened the eyes of the blind. That's why I was sent. That's why I was anointed to bring recovery of sight. Without Jesus, we can't see anything. We find ourselves tonight in our journey through the tabernacle. If you haven't been here the last couple weeks, please catch up online with us because we're having fun, amen? This is good stuff. Talk about Jesus in the Old Testament, hence the gospel of Exodus. It's just all about the light of the world. And as we pass the altar, which we'll have a fun week with that one, and the laven mixed with blood and water, and we walked in last week, we turned to the right, and we looked at the table of showbread, our shoe bread. And we looked at the bread of faces. We looked about how God's intent is fellowship, to have face-to-face contact with us. Well, this week we're turning to the left as we walk into the holy place. We're looking at the lampstand or the menorah. You might be familiar with that word. This word menorah, if you're taking notes, which you're insane if you don't, write it down. Menorah in the Hebrew means, you ready? Light bearer. Let me just cut to the chase. Jesus is the lampstand. He's the one. Why? Because he's the one who was sent. He's the one who was anointed. He was the one to bring recovery of sight to the blind so we could get face to face with our creator. When you walked in, you turned to the left, you saw the menorah, the lamp stand, the light bear. And interesting enough, you turned to the left, which was always going to be turning to the south, which in the Hebrew, this was so far out. The Hebrew word for south means bright or radiant. <laughs> God's so cool, right? See, you took a left to something bright and radiant to witness the light bearer. Why? So you could actually see God. Because, see, as you walked into this place, this lampstand, this light bearer, what's significant, number three, about the lampstand is it was hidden, but it was seen. See, it was hidden to everyone outside of the world, but to the priests, it was seen. See, to those that love God, they see Jesus for who he is. Those in the world outside of that holy place, they don't see. They're blind. 
Jesus was just a good teacher, a good rabbi, a failure, some would say. By the world standards, he was. All his leaders forsook him, all that. His people rejected him. God's economy is quite different from man's. Amen? Praise God for that. But hidden but seen. Also, take note of this lampstand. It faced two things. It faced the priest. We'll read in Exodus 25 that the bowls where the light was at faced forward. One, towards the priest, and two, straight towards the showbread. It was highlighting the provision of God. I think of John 17 where Jesus says, And the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. The whole intent of the lampstand, who is the light bearer, who is Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. He's the one who says this glory, which we could really get into a whole study about the anointing oil that comes forth. That'll be another week, so just hold your horses on that one. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to myself. But it's this glory that's coming forth and opening the eyes of the priest and he allowing to see. This whole picture of the lampstand is about giving the priests of God anointed vision. Why? to lead us to that most holy place. It's always about fellowship with him. You know that, right? It's always about partnership, fellowship, connection, oneness with God. That was why we started right there at the Ark of the Covenant. He didn't start there in Exodus 25 with the altar or the basin. It was right with the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat with the blood and the testimony within and the angels and the blood in between, just like in the tomb when Mary came in, right? Beautiful shadow and picture and fulfillment right from the beginning. beginning, God is saying, I want to meet you there. Right from the beginning, I've come to give recovery of sight that you might come back as the blind man with eyes to see. Eyes to see who? Jesus. He wants you to see him. It's not enough for him that he sees you. He wants you to see him. Remember the first time you fell in love and you saw your potential future spouse? You saw them, you just didn't know if they saw you. <laughs> Remember when you finally figured out they saw you? Ooh, that was a cool day. Right? That's what it was like. Remember that night, Kathy, that one church I was playing at, the Assemblies of God? I remember she walked in, and I saw her, and I would finished playing with this band, this thing. Going, I'm like you know, 19 years old, and I'm looking at her going, holy cow, geez, wow, she's beautiful. Man, I haven't dated in a year, Jesus, since I got saved, and I haven't wanted to, but she's driving me crazy. I can't stop looking at her. And then all of a sudden I look, and she's looking at me. Go, oh, she's looking at me. She's looking at me. It was that moment of going, it's not that just I see her. She sees me. <laughs> it's awesome. But that's the way it is with the Lord. It's like he sees us, but don't you think it brings his heart joy to know that you see him? That's what broke me to pieces today. I'm like, God, your heart is overwhelmed. You, we steal your heart when we look at you? Yeah. He wants intimacy. <laughs> he wants fellowship with us. That's the point. That's the lampstand. As we look at this typology, this incredibly rich, prophetic, profound typology of the lampstand, Jesus wants you to see him tonight in a way maybe you haven't before. May the Lord bless us as we look at this. Well, Exodus, chapter 25. Look with me at verse 31 as we make these five observations about the light bearer from God. Exodus chapter 25, verse 31. The instruction came from the pattern from heaven saying, you shall also make a lampstand of pure Gold. Stop there. You'll take note that this 
furnishing. Unlike the table of showbread that was mixed with acacia wood and gold, speaking of the Son of Man, the Son of God. Now, this lampstand is made of pure gold. We'll read a talent of gold, basically 125 pounds of pure gold. The first thing that's being noticed about the light of the world of the Messiah, the one who actually opens the eyes that we might see who God is and what he's done for us, the first thing we take up note of is that he came to give us eyes to see his purity. His purity. Genesis chapter 1, taking a little step backwards here to get an idea of what the message really is here about purity. It says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was the face over the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, so the evening and morning were the first day. God wants to make it very clear that there is a defining darkness, a division between darkness and light, between man and God, between what is holy and what is not. And him who came to open the eyes of the blind is not a man. He's God. John, the half-brother of Jesus, he said in chapter 1, this is the message we have heard from the beginning and declare to you that God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. Now see, you might go, Dave, this is a real duh moment. We know God's perfect. He's perfectly pure. We get that. Do we really? See, even the disciples thought that God was sleeping in the boat, forsaking them, forgot his snooze alarm, whatever. We do the same thing. We kind of go, God, I know you're perfect, but sometimes I feel like you're mad at me. God, I know you're perfect, but sometimes I think you love other people more. Pure gold. We don't have eyes to really see God for who he truly is, you see. We label him as something he's not. Balaam was a prophet who did that. You know the story of Balaam and Balak? Where you had Balaam, this prophet who had mixture with light and darkness, and he was giving a witness to the Moabites of light and darkness, totally misrepresenting who God is. You know the story. We're not going to read the whole story, but just to give you an idea from Numbers chapter 18, where God is basically redirecting their thinking about who he is because they're mixed, they're mudding the waters. <laughs> he says, rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, and he will not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? God is Pure, pure gold, pure deity, without flaw, without darkness. God wants us to see this about him. It's really important. Why? Well, see, this is why he's defending his own reputation with the Moabites and with Balaam and the children of Israel are watching because they're mixing him together. We kind of do the same thing. We see God misrepresented by a contemporary modern-day Balak, you know, false gospel preachers, filthy lucres in the church, all these people that come and misrepresent God, parents who say they're Christians but live like pagans, lots of things. And, and we grow up and we get this concept of God that he's not completely pure. Man breaks his word God must do so as well. No, he doesn't. He's perfect. Now, if you don't think this is important, understand it is, because right from the beginning he's saying, if you want to see who I am and really see me and me see you, then you need to understand the lampstand is pure gold. There's no wood. There's no humanity here. There's nothing tainting or filtering who I am. We get so jaded, don't we? 
And we transfer that to God and his promises. That's why we doubt his promises. You say it's finished, but I have a hard time with that, Lord. Why? Because you think God's a man that he would lie. He's not. He loves you in spite of you. He really does. He's forgiven you for everything you'll ever do. He really has. I know you have a hard time swallowing that one. Why? Because you think God's a man. He's not. Pure gold. Jesus was without sin. There's no gray. There's no darkness. Those who really let that soak in, you know what they start doing? They start shining quite a bit brighter than they used to. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. See, when you really start to see that God is not this shade of gray or, or the glory of God's not on a dimmer according to what kind of life you live that day, you know, and you start to see for who he is, all of a sudden you begin to walk like a child of who he is, pure light, holy. It's, just, it's a reflex. It's a Holy Ghost reflex. It's not something you have to hope you got to jump through or if your checkbook's big enough to write, or if you have enough skills, or if you can lead worship, or how many people have you led to the Lord. None of that stuff impresses the Lord because nobody on earth can do that. Only God can do that through people, right? So once you start to see that, you just go, wow, Lord, you're the only one who's pure. And I've been lining you up with my perception of other people, and you're not like anyone else I've ever met. He wants us to see that about him. So before we move on to the next thing, I just want you to have a reality check right now. If there's any area of your life you've been somehow allowing lies in your mind and misrepresent the character of God, the person of God, the heart of God, the mind of God, you need to call that down quickly. Forgive me for considering you to be a man. If you say something, you mean it, Lord. If you make a promise, you will keep it. Do you know anybody else like that? I don't. I know people that come close sometimes, but we don't know anyone who always keeps their word, always loves, always forgives, always is there and never leaves you. I don't know anyone like that. Nobody. Only Jesus. Only him. You know why? Pure gold. Drink that one in for a while. The next thing I want you to look at here in the next part of verse 31, we'll just actually start from the beginning again here. It says, you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be hammered work or beaten. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornament knobs, and its flowers shall be one piece. It says here that this lampstand, this light bearer of pure deity shall be hammered. She'll be beaten. Jesus came to anoint us that we have eyes to see, you ready, his suffering. I remember the first time I saw the movie The Passion, and I'm not vouching for that movie doctrinally by any means, but I will say this, that the first time I saw that for two days, I couldn't talk. Because it just, I just couldn't talk. Because I, I had this picture, I saw him, I'm going, that's what you did for me? Lord, you want to give me eyes to see what you did for me. Speaking of the book of Isaiah that Jesus opened up in Luke 4, listen to this from Isaiah chapter 52. It says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. I want you to think about this. What Jesus did because of your little white lie because where you lost your temper, 
because of whatever thing you did that separated you from the holiness of God, he had to do. The suffering he took, he says he was marred beyond human likeness. In other words, on the cross, it didn't look like a man. It looked like this big shredded piece of meat with eyes. What does that do to you? Because I can tell you, while God in eternity was watching them hammer this pure gold, no sin, deity, and just hammer it and shape it into this form of something that would bring light where there was darkness. In heaven, there was a pattern, right? Everything that we read about in Exodus is a copy of a pattern that was not in time, but in eternity. Speaking of this beaten lampstand, look with me at Revelation 5. Let's jump ahead out of time into eternity, which we'll get there soon enough. Revelation 5, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, seven seals. This is none other than title deed to planet earth, another study for another time. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look at it. But the elder said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, perfect strength and omniscience and omnipresence, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the world. Then he came to look and took the scroll out of the right hand who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp. So when you get to heaven, folks, you get a harp. Cool. The Greek word is katharis, so it's a guitar with a martial stack in Jesus' name. Maybe. In golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Why? For you were slain, you were beaten, you were hammered, Lord. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Somebody say, yes, Lord. (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. Why do we get to reign? Why do we get to? Because he was slain. Because God became a man and was beaten because of our sin. Jesus has come to open our eyes to see this. The impact of this is humbling. It's, it's physically crippling. It's like, Isaiah, I can't even speak. I see your glory and what you've done. I can't even speak, Lord. I'm so humbled. What was it like for Mary and Martha as they stood there at the cross, kneeling with his blood flowing down, seeing his glory, seeing his suffering like they had never seen anything before? They had eyes to see. The Romans around, they saw, but they didn't see. They didn't have eyes to see the suffering servant. They just saw a man. They saw a blasphemer in their eyes. Mary and Martha and the girls, they saw God. They saw deity. They saw purity, suffering for their sins. One day, we'll all be before the throne of God. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? His sufferings, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's like, I want to know the lampstand. I want to know the light bearer. I want to see him and I want to see me and I want to share in his glory. But I realize to share in his glory, I've got to share in his sufferings, the 
fellowship of his sufferings. Folks, this is Christianity. This is what the lampstand is talking about. Not only does the Lord want to give us eyes to see his purity and eyes to see his suffering, but third, eyes to see his fellowship. Look with me at Exodus chapter 25, verse 32. It says, and six branches shall come out of its sides. Six being in the Bible the number of what? The number of man. Six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand on one side and three branches of the lampstand on the other side. So here, God says, out of this light bearer, this source of revelation, I want branches to come out of its side. There's one main stem above the other three and these three but they're going to come right out of the side. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Here, poetically, prophetically, this lampstand says, out of this side I'll bear three, and out of this side, I'll bear three. We'll be one, but they'll be separate in this side and that side, but but I'm the one that's going to make us all one. Either you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, but I want you to know it doesn't matter. There are some today that are Jewish, missing Jews that think somehow they're a little bit more special. Get over yourself. Okay? That one will get me in trouble for sure. (laughs) Romans chapter 11, let me go a little further with that. For the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. There's a picture here in the menorah. We have the main stem and three out of this side and three out of this side. Hey, you abide in me and your branches, right? Right? But the focal point is, I want us to be one. Jesus was always praying, don't you love John 17? Father, make them one, just like we're one. Right? John, I love this prayer he prays in the epistle, this word exhortation, I should call it, where he said, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We declare to you that God is light and there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, or this word partnership with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, him who is light and there's no darkness at all, light is about fellowship. It's about restoring. Where there was separation, now there's connection. There's partnership. Not just with God, check it out, but with each other. That's the picture of the branches, you see. It's really important to Jesus that his kids get along. I think that's why Jesus said, hey, if you're at the altar and you're worshiping, you're trying to go vertical, but you got a problem with one of your fellow branches, drop your gift and go do some mending on the branch. I love you, God. I just can't stand my wife. Well, let's remember 1 Peter 3 says, if you have a problem with your spouse, then your prayers are hindered. Hmm. In other words, I can't focus on the vertical if the horizontal, the connection with the branches aren't right. Jesus came to give us eyes to see what fellowship, his fellowship is really like. Fellowship with him is synonymous with fellowship with his people. They're one and the same. I love you, God. I can't stand your people. Wrong. But see, a lot of Christians are like that. 
Well, I'm not. How many churches have you been to in the last 10 years? Ouch. How many people have you prayed for as you really were gossiping about them? Jesus, he is in the midst of his people. He's watching how we connect and correlate and respond to the branches around us. He's watching because he wants us to be one piece, right? The symbolism is mind-boggling. In Revelation chapter 1, where the apostle John's on the island of Patmos, and he hears the voice of Jesus drawing him close to fellowship with him, it says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Light, fellowship, connection, seeing him. Revelation chapter 2, it says, The angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Lampstands, light, fellowship. The point of the lampstand, you're getting it, right? Is it clicking? And the world is so watching us. See, that's one of the ways you know if you're really in his presence, if you're really experiencing the Shekinah glory of God that transforms and you're really just overtaken with the mercy seat of God in your life, if, if you're not really connected with the branches, don't even think about entering in the most holy place with God. You can't. It doesn't work. It's hypocrisy. It's religion. Jesus wants to touch us because he wants us to see his body, his branches, the way that he sees them. If you really want to test your heart as a worshiper, then begin to think and say, Lord, I just welcome you, Holy Spirit, to speak to me right now about anyone, any of your branches that I've cursed by isolating myself, by judging, by not praying blessing and speaking life to about loving them, even though they don't own where they've hurt me, I'm going to love them just like they did. Because you, the main stem, while I was yet a sinner, you loved me and died for me. I get it. My eyes are opened. I have an anointed vision to see what fellowship looks like to you. How you see fellowship, now I see fellowship that way, Lord. It always precedes true transformation and worship. Always. There is no exception to the rule. So rather than fast, rather than sing the most anointed worship song that you've heard on the radio, repent. Repent of your self-righteousness. Repent of your gossip. Repent. And come into agreement with Jesus. Father, make us one. One piece. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. Jesus is the lampstand, but we've been grafted into that lampstand, right? You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If we're going to be a lampstand that shines light for the glory of God, then we have to realize, wow, the glory that God the Father gave Jesus, he has given to us. He's grafted us in, and the same spirit of the living God that flowed through Messiah flows through us. And it's all for the purpose that we would shine a light that the world would look like seeing a city on a hill and go, that's the Christian group. No, no, no. Not the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the Methodists or the Lutheran. No, that's the Christian group. That's the people who love Messiah. That's the people who have loved the light of life and used to be blind, but now they see. That's that group of people. That's what the world is literally and spiritually dying to see. Back to Exodus. Exodus 34 Verse 34, I should say, it says, On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. 
and there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same. According to the six branches that extend from the lampstand, their knobs and their branches shall be one piece. All of it shall be hammered piece of pure gold. We're going to go ahead and put a picture up here of, actually a couple pics, of what this lampstand looks like. Because some of you I know are probably wondering, there you go. Now this is a, a very good representation of what it actually looked like back then. You'll notice the three coming out on each side, and the one in the middle is a little higher, as it should be, amen? The name above all names, that's the way it should be. Another pick, here's a pick of one they have there in Israel today that they've made as they're working on rebuilding the temple. Now you'll notice the almond blossoms are not there as it should be, and you'll notice the center stem is not higher than the others as it should be. And there's a reason why it's not up to specs, because it's not acknowledging the glory of Jesus Christ. It says here that there should be almond blossoms, a bud and a blossom. We see the knob and the flower and the actual fruit itself, which some commentators believe this speaks of the very stages of the glory of Christ and the glory of Christians, where you see actually the knob or the bud, and you see the flower that opens up, and you see the almond, and you see the fruit of it. Interesting enough, the almond is actually the first fruit in the land of Israel to bud and to bear fruit. First above everything else is the almond. That's why we call it almond joy, right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, I, zing, had to put that in there. I know, that was pretty bad. Jeremiah chapter 1. Back on track here. Here we go. Jeremiah chapter 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Almond tree. First to bud, first to bear fruit. We also know that inside the Ark of the Covenant, was not only the testimony, but there was what? Aaron's rod that budded what? Very good. Look at me in Numbers chapter 17. This is after Korah's rebellion, another great study to get into, which we're headed that direction. Following that, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and get from them a rod from each father's house and their leaders according to their father's house, twelve rods. Write each man's name on his rod, and you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. Then you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall be the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you. So Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and each of their leaders gave him a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's house, is twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron's among their rods. And Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. Now it came to pass the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron in the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out the rods from before the Lord and the children of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. And the Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to keep as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me lest they die. This was a picture of God saying the only hope that man has against the rebellious, against my rule and reign, is if I can take something that's dead and bring it to life. That's the only hope. And he chooses the very fruit in the promised land of God that is the first fruits. Guys, this is a picture of the glory of Christ. 
the resurrected glory of Christ. Not only is a lampstand a picture of his suffering and his fellowship, it's a picture of his glory. It's a picture of his resurrected glory. Hallelujah. There goes those goosebumps again. I love it. 1 Corinthians 15, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of all those who fall asleep. For since the man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. As for as in all Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ is the first fruits among those who are in Christ at his coming. Hallelujah. This picture of the lampstand and the almonds, the bud, the flower, the fruit, it's all a picture of Jesus saying, I see you, I want you to see me, I want you to share in my glory and my fellowship, and I want you to share in my resurrection power. It's beautiful. The gospel of Exodus. How awesome is that? I mean, we don't even have time to get into the bowls that held the anointing oil. Because we know what follows when you see Jesus and he sees you and you walk with him. There's an anointing that flows, right? We'll have some fun that week, I promise you. Well, closing out this, uh, this chapter here, verse 37, you shall make seven lamps for it. Now we see that number of completion or perfection. And they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wicker trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. And it shall be made of a talent of pure gold. We talked about that roughly about 125 pounds of pure gold with its utensils. In verse 40, see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. We have this picture of the suffering of God and the fellowship of God and the glory of God. But we see this incredible picture of the perfection of God. Number seven, he's the one that makes it perfect, right? And he says, I want you to do this according to a pattern that was shown you from something that's above you. This, this is not earthly. It's, it's a heavenly pattern. It's not a temporal pattern. It's an eternal pattern. That's why the writer of Hebrews, which I'm convinced was Apostle Paul, chapter 8, it says, now this is the point of the things which we are saying. And their topic talking about the tabernacle and all the furnishings. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. And Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all these things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now, I always love but now, usually. But now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Huh. Oh, better God's way is better. See, these people want to worship Jehovah God. We've been rescued from Egypt, from sin. We want to follow after you. We want to be baptized in the Red Sea. We want to make your name above all names. But we need to do it his way, not our way. We like to take our way and mix it in with his way like Balaam and Balak wanted to do. It doesn't work. It has to be the pattern that he shows us. And he wants to anoint our eyes to see the way he wants it done. He has a perfect plan, by the way. Isn't it awesome to think that when you're, not only when you're born again, hey, even before the earth was created, those who would be born again, he already had every second of every day in time, in eternity future, already the blueprint was already done, inspected, stamped, done. That's incredible. But see, some GCs, they look at a blueprint and they go, well, this is what the architect says, but he's not on the job. He doesn't understand. He's not here. Let me just kind of pencil and erase that and change that a little bit. 
you will fail your inspection if you do that. <laughs> I know this. I've done that. <laughs> but God says, hey, if you're going to worship me, I have a perfect plan. And I want you to have eyes. To, you won't trust his plan as perfect if you don't believe he's perfectly pure. You won't be humbled enough to trust him unless you really have eyes to see that he suffered for your sin. You won't have eyes to follow his perfect plan and humble yourself if you're not walking in his glory and instead of walking in your own. Do you get it? He's got a perfect plan. It starts with looking as he was beaten for us. That's why Romans 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It just makes sense. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed or metamorphosized, right, from the inside out, by the renewing of your mind, here you go, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, and I like this, the perfect will of God. God has got this perfect plan. It's already mapped out. It's it's awesome. And he's shown it to you. He took you up on the mountain. He showed it to you. He gave you his word. He's put his spirit inside you. He's opened your eyes because he wants you to have a relationship. He wants you to worship him, not because he's an egomaniac. When you have your kids, oh, I just love it when my kid for the first time said, Daddy, I love you. Why, because you're an egomaniac or because you really value intimacy? Hello, right? God wants us to worship him and proclaim our love for him because he wants intimacy. That's why he healed the blind man in John 9. He saw him blind. He saw him in darkness. Hey, I want him to see. But what's interesting about this story, and this is kind of where we'll close, I think. <laughs> is he healed him, and then he said, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam and wash the water, wash the mud and my saliva right out of your eyes. And it says that he returned seeing, but he didn't return seeing Jesus. He returned seeing the Pharisees and a bunch of religious people. Right? That's usually what happens many times. People get to see who Jesus is, and they're so psyched that they used to be blind, and now they see, and then they run into Christians. They run into Calvinist and Arminianist. Take your pick. I'm an equal opportunity offender. People who put an emphasis on impressing themselves theologically more than worshiping Jesus. There you go. So usually we'll run into people like that at first and we get really discouraged and judged and Judaized. We, the people trying to throw the law back on us, either that or create a road of licentiousness based on grace, you can do whatever you want to do, whatever it is. Basically trying to close our eyes and bewitch us and blind us again. But Jesus, see, he allows that to happen because it's a test. This is a test, right? Well, that's what happened with the, the blind man in John. And in John chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he had found him, he already found him once, right? He's finding him again. Do you believe in the Son of God? And the blind man said to him, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in? Because remember, he hasn't seen Jesus, right? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. The face of Christ is being revealed. His eyes are open, and he's seeing Jesus. And then he said, Lord, I believe, and underline these words, and he worshipped him. Right then, he went into the most holy place, face to face with God, seeing his glory, shed himself of the religious shroud and self-righteousness and the approval of man who gives a rip. All I need to know is you love me and you see me and I see you and I have anointed eyes because you are the Messiah, the anointed one that can give recovery of sight to the blind. And Lord, I see you. That's his heart. Not just towards him, it's his heart towards you. It's his heart towards me. Folks, he loves us. He loves us. Father, God loves us. He doesn't care 
what you've done. He was hammered for your sins. And he just wants to be connected with you. He wants his glory to flow through you. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for such a gift as this. That you would take a wild weed like us, aimlessly moving, and graft us into such glory. Thank you, Lord, for touching our eyes that we might be able to see you and bless you. That our gaze upon you would bless your heart, Father. Thank you for such an intimate love that you have for us. Thank you, God, for melting our hearts with such suffering for filling our hearts with hope, with such glory. We welcome you, Lord, to come and pour out that glory in these last days upon your people. We truly desire, Lord, to be a light like a city on a hill. May you make us one, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, and every saint said, Amen. Family of God, God bless you. Let's have a wonderful night of fellowship.